All right, thanks, Jim. I first want to acknowledge everyone involved with the Central Region Digital Aviation Services. As, as Jim said, Brian Hirsch, he's the Central Region Aviation Program Leader, among lots of other hats. Jeff Craven is the Chief Central Region Scientific Services person. And also, Cami Sims up at National Weather Service Headquarters, she's the project lead for Digital Aviation Services. Here at Milwaukee Sullivan, Jerry Wiedenfeld, he's the ITO. He's been um, he's the person that's been keeping this going and developing it. He is sitting here with me, and he'll be available for lots of technical questions if you come up with them. Also, Denny Van Cleves, he's the DFE focal point here. He's been doing a lot with uh, formatter and tools and keeping everything up to date. So we will get started. The reason why we're doing an update an updated webinar here today is because there is a tech note released to all of Central Region yesterday, and it contains a new TAF formatter. This is a pretty big update with the TAF formatter, and it is better than what you had before. The, the um, Global Services Division out of Boulder, GSD, uh, they are the contract people for making digital aviation services, TAF formatter, and tools, and, uh, and they're making them on the national level. So there's a national team comprised of lots of forecasters, SUs, um, across a lot of WFOs across the country, along in coordination with headquarters. This team is working with GSD to make improvements to the TAF formatter. So what Jerry sent out to the region in the tech note yesterday is the almost latest uh, TAF formatter from GFE or GSD. And the reason why I say almost latest is because we do get updates made from GSD pretty frequently. And so what we're doing as a region is uh, sending you out the latest stable TAF formatter. And we will make it this will make it easy for you guys down the line to update updated TAF formatters. All right, so what, what we're getting in this uh, tech note, make sure your ITOs, uh, make sure you're coordinating with your ITOs when you're talking about this tech note. Um, and when you're installing it, aviation focal points and uh, AWIB's focal points will have a say in how this formatter operates for your office. With the formatter, we introduce new standardized sky cover thresholds and also some new weather thresholds. Uh, the, there are minor updates to the uh, aviation finalized procedure. And also, Jerry put in a 12 panel procedure for B2D. So we'll show you a little bit about that. For the sky cover threshold, this was changed on a national level. So now all of the country is going to be using the sky cover percentage to determine um, sky clear, few, scattered, broken, overcast in your TAF. Um, here's the breakdown on the screen. And so as an office, you guys can update your color schemes for sky cover and kind of maybe do the breakdown. So you, as a forecaster, when you're making sky grids, will know what type of coverage you'll be getting in your TAF formatter. As I mentioned, we'll be getting, we also are getting new weather rules built into the TAF formatter. Uh, the weather rules, they determine how uh, thunderstorms are put into the TAF or how other precipitation, like rain and snow showers, are put into the TAF. Uh, basically, in the short term, if you have likely or categorical um, for your weather, it's not reading your POPs. It's reading your weather string. That's going to determine in the short term, you'd probably get prevailing thunderstorms. And the algorithm goes on to farther out in the TAF period, where it would be VCTS if you had likely or categorical in your weather terms. Um, so these tables sum up what the new weather rules are. 
All right, well, here's something new. Offices will be able to modify the weather rules to cater to your office. Now, one thing with this new TAF formatter is it has, it produces quite a few tempo groups and prob 30 groups, especially the prob 30. Some offices I've been hearing have, a, have an office policy where they don't put prob 30 groups, they don't use them. And you know what, that's fine, except that your TAF formatter is going to make a lot of them. Now, what we sent out to everyone as a default is that you'll get prob 30 groups between 9 and 18 hours of the TAF period, but not in the outer periods. If your office chooses not to do a prob 30 group, this is where you co coordinate with your AWIPS focal point or your ITO, and you can make changes to your TAF definition file. And there are instructions included with the with the tech note so that you know how to do this and that you'd be able to modify this. Um, there was also a fix for the weather types. You know, we used to, if we had scattered flurries, which we code as scattered light, light snow showers, um, it would put a VCSH in the TAF. It will no longer do that. Um, and so there are some improvements made to the weather rules with the latest TAF formatter. Uh, Denny made an update to the aviation finalized procedure, just a minor update. It actually adds additional time range options, that's including amendments. So if you choose to write amendments with your TAF formatter, this will make it easy to do. There was a little bug in the procedure before where it, it uh, didn't finalize for the whole time period. So now it's fixed and better. All right, like I mentioned earlier, there have been a lot of requests since the last webinar for offices to get a 12-panel D2D procedure. And uh, so Jerry made it available for everyone in this tech note. And what it does is it shows your GFE output, basically, in the D2D format. Um, I have instructions in the in the um, tech note for navigating through the 12 panel configuration and maybe how to see some of the model names. They're pretty small. If, well, if you have any questions, make sure you let us know. And I think, I think you'll, you'll like it. This is just one of the advantages of using the 12 panel D2D screen is so that you're not clicking through every individual grid in GFE. Just an alternate way to way of looking at things. So that's the visibility screen capture here, and the cloud-based primary screen capture here. All right. Now, one thing I do need to point out with you is that there's a DR open and for AWIPS too with NCF, a, a trouble ticket. Uh, the models aren't going to update automatically with this procedure. It's a known bug, and it's because it has to do with data being loaded into the product browser. So what you'll need to do is reopen that procedure periodically to make sure those models are up, up to date. Hopefully in one of the next new AWIPS builds, that will be fixed. All right. Um, Available in the CR DOS toolbox, which I'll get into where that is, there's a, a, a CR DOS status spreadsheet available. This is a Google spreadsheet that Brian made, and it's just to get us all on the same page, let Brian know where your office is in the digital aviation services development for your office. If it's not up to date, I have all central region on the screen capture here. If you're noticing it's a little outdated, make sure you go in and, and uh, update that. And we'll come back to that a little later in the talk. Now remember that in the last webinar, which was in January, I talked about kind of a gradual process of adopting digital aviation services into your office. 
Now everyone is in step one. All right, everybody is having con short populated in the background, the task formatter is running in the background, everything's automated. Hopefully you forecasters have had a chance to use that model data that's being populated and just looking through it and seeing how it's doing. Now if you haven't already, I encourage you to start using the task formatter. Just let everything run in the background as it's going and move into step two where you are um, starting with the task formatter as a starting point when you're writing your routine tasks. Your wins will be consistent with your grids. Wins in your tasks will be consistent with your grids. Task writing process could be a little quicker this way because it will already set up your from groups. Now I skipped a slide here, um, but notice that everyone in central region is operational with your, uh, or not operational, I'm sorry, wrong word. Um, everyone is being able to internally see the visibility and ceiling height grid. Internal NDFD graphics are available in your AWIPS Firefox web browser. I have the address up at the top of the screen. Uh, you see a lot of 7 and 10s for visibility in this picture, and the 10-mile visibility is white, so that's why it looks kind of silly on the national picture. But anyway, this is a way you can uh, see regionally or nationally what your neighbors are doing, but you're also in ISC and GFE. All right, so now everybody has step one. Hopefully you're starting your tasks with your task formatter. That's step two. If you haven't started that, please give it a try. Prompt your office forecasters to give it a try. Um, the new task formatter is improved, so I think you'll like it. Now, let's say you feel like most of your office is ready to start editing grids and you don't want them wiped away with the automated con short repopulate every six hours. If this is, if more and more people in your office are becoming frustrated with grids being wiped away, then you need to have your ITO or AWIS focal point run, rerun a script, one of the installation scripts that Jerry has, and the instructions are, they'll have the instructions. Um, if you need help, talk to Jerry. But you rerun the script and that will, you can disable that automation in the background. This means your office is in that experimental phase where you're, you're editing your aviation grids and your other grids prior to actually generating your task formatter. Um, so of course you got to go through your local office team process um, and then Forecasters will be focusing on your flight categories, not necessarily exactly the ceiling or visibility you're expecting in the observation. Because the task formatter focuses on flight categories. Here's kind of a visual of that procedure when you're experimental. The aviation populate procedure with con short will run. You can run it manually or it'll run at at times, the banner will pop up if you haven't done it in the last five and a half hours. You can evaluate the con short. If you don't like what con short is giving you, then you can make edits. And then the aviation finalized will take care of quality control tools. Um, it'll give you a couple extra options and it'll publish your grids. You can run your task formatter after that. And you make edits to the task before sending it. You do that in AVN FPS. Now there's a, a goal. This hasn't been confirmed from Central Region yet. It's still undergoing negotiation. But the goal is that spring 2017, that all offices in Central Region will be will be operational with digital aviation services. That means every a minimum every six hours we'll be editing, collaborating, 
saving publishing the aviation grids, sealing and visibility, you'll go to NDFD and point and click. And you'll be using your TAF formatter as a starting point for writing your tasks and sending that. Well, how are we going to get to our goal? There, the Central Region Grid Methodology Team has made a proposal for a test bed. And there will be like um, 8 to 12 offices involved in the test bed in the August through November time period. This will take care of the late summer and then the early fall time. And so we can get all sorts of weather in within this test bed period. What the test bed offices are going to be doing is exploring collaboration methods and uh, finding some best practices for grid population. And they're also going to evaluate some experimental gridded guidance that we're going to be getting from the Aviation Weather Center. And like I said, our goal is to become operational spring 2017. This proposal is undergoing negotiations at the Regional Labor Council at this time. All right, one way we want you guys to communicate with the Digital Aviation Services team in Central Region is through VLAB. Now, you probably are aware that there's a CR Sioux account in VLAB, while there's also a CR DAS VLAB account. Um, now, to get signed up for VLAB, like, you first need to go to the straight VLAB account. The instructions are here. And sign in with your email address. And then you've got to sign up for the community. And you'll be able to search for CRDOS or CRSU, both of them. Um, and then you can go to this direct link once you're signed up and, and into the system. This is a, this is a resource that you, has a uh, forum where you can ask questions, and you'll get an answer, hopefully, as soon as possible. And then it's also a resource for where all the documentation and links are located. It's a one-stop shop. All right, well, since we're into the summer season now, and if you're working with ConShort, you're noticing that, OK, ConShort does really well in IFR situations. But now that we're in like the diurnal queue season, ConShort isn't picking up on my 5,000 foot cumulus ceilings or something. Um, this is a weakness, and it's known. But that's where the forecaster comes in and says, all right, during these daylight hours, during this time period, I want diurnal queue to be there. And you've looked at soundings. You're pretty confident there's going to be diurnal queue developing. And so remember that we have this cloud-based primary from RH tool. What it does is it um, kind of, if you will, looks at like a buff kit sounding for the model determined in this GUI. And you can uh, determine that height of the cloud base. The tool can adjust the sensitivity of the RH so that you can, uh, I don't know, detect your your cloud base a little better. So I encourage you guys to use this and experiment with it. And it, we find it pretty useful here at Milwaukee. All right, just know that there are a few other, uh, few other um, fields. So what you're going to be doing is ConShort will automatically populate your visibility and your cloud base primary. Those are the only two grids you need to edit the ceiling will fall out of your cloud-based primary. Remember, that's based on your cloud-based primary and your sky cover. OK, but there's these three additional grids that are always blank. ConShort doesn't populate them. If you manually populate them for a certain time period, they're going to make your task formatter do a few different things. Your cloud-based secondary is going to help you get, like, a scattered group beneath the ceiling. I found one day we had, we here at Milwaukee, we had um, diurnal queue developing at 5,000 feet, kind of scattered. And we had overcast 250, overcast 25,000 cirrus 
but we, we're still getting diurnal cue. So what I was able to do is populate this cloud-based secondary with, um, for a short time period during the afternoon hours, with a 5,000 foot. And so what the TAF formatter gave me was scattered 050 and broken 250. So I've, now the conditional grids, cloud-based conditional, visibility conditional, that will actually generate a tempo group for you in your TAF. And as a definition from the, the directive, you can only have a tempo group in the first nine hours. And so the TAF formatter knows that. Just things to play along with, play around with. All right, what Jerry is now working on is a GFE forecast monitor update. And I don't know if you have this at your office yet, but he's going to be putting this out in a tech note in the next coming, coming months. And what it will do is give you the aviation elements, the ceiling and visibility that are picked up by the METARs. And this is a situational awareness tool. And it'll, it'll help you visualize how your grids are, how your aviation grids are doing. Because remember, we have our AVN FPS to monitor just our TAF sites, but we do have more METAR, METAR sites across the, our areas, and this is a good way to keep an eye on them. All right, as I mentioned before, we've got this CR DOS toolbox. This is the same toolbox that we talked about in the first webinar. It hasn't changed. The address hasn't changed. The thing is, I added a kind of an embedded toolbox that says May 2016. So if you go in there, you're going to find this presentation and then some updated documents. And then I'm going to be continuously adding to it. Here's that uh, toolbox May 2016 that's popping up here. And this is where I have an explanation of that new formatter documentation. It's all about it, and it contains links to extra documentation, even by DSD, on how to edit the weather rules. And this is also documentation that your ITO got with the techno. Patrick Ide from Vismark, he made, he made the first two-page DOS guide and what he did was he updated it to handle the new TAF formatter rules with uh, new sky cover and the new weather rules. The thing is, what if your office decides to edit the weather rules or change them? Um, he, I included the publisher file with this, uh, the toolbox, the CR DOS toolbox, and that you can modify that to fit your office's needs. And uh, coming up here on the click here is the next page. As you can see, it's an easy way to uh, see digital aviation services and help your office along in the process of getting spun up. All right, back to the spreadsheet, the status spreadsheet. Um, how is your office doing? What we're going to do is un unmute your lines, either by request or as Jim can get to you, and we are going to kind of go around and see how your offices are doing. If you haven't had a chance to update the status spreadsheet, it is located in the CR DOS toolbox online. And we have, uh, Brian has different categories that in a drop-down menu. You're either trying it, you're interested in it, you're testing it, or your office is operational and, or experimental and doing it. Um, <clears throat> There are extra things you can add here, so I just want to know how everyone is doing. Also, Jerry's here, and we want to hear some feedback from those offices that have been doing digital aviation services, or if you haven't, what has been stopping you? We want to hear about it and, um, and see if you, have, if you have any questions. So, Jim, can you help me out and see who is unmuted at this time? and? can maybe answer some questions? 
Sure. Um, I did get a couple questions, and I will go ahead and ask those, and then while you're answering those, I'll go ahead and unmute everybody. Um, the first one was from uh, Chris Guitro, and his question was, are there any plans for a 12-panel procedure for visibility? Okay, well, Chris, I think I, did I answer your question by showing you the, the visibility 12 panel? And Chris, you're unmuted if you want to, if you can want to talk. Okay, I don't hear anything from Chris. He might not have a speaker on his microphone. So I don't know if he asked that question before I got to it in the in the webinar or it was early. Um, it was about early in the process. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm unmuting everybody. Um, I know a lot of people might be listening via their uh, computer, and they might not have a microphone. So even though you're unmuted, you might not be able to talk. So um, everybody is everybody unmuted is right, right now. Right um, now. I do have I another do have question another from question. Jeff Logston. Jeff, Logston. Jeff you. Jeff, you, uh, you want to go ahead and, go ahead and can you ask the, ask the question? If not, I can read it. Yeah, I was just wondering if uh, there's been any questions relayed about the interpolation of the of the ceiling grids. We are going from you know, negative thirty thousand to where there actually is a ceiling, and that interpolation where the con short hourly contract available to you might be bogus. IFR value since it tries to interpolate from like a 15,000 ceiling to that negative 30,000. There's a lot of feedback here. Can everyone make sure your line is muted, please? And then we'll... All right, so first, um, when we're dealing with what Kant Short's doing, it actually doesn't do any um, work on the actual ceiling grid. What it's working on is the, the cloud-based primary, and then it uses the sky cover grid um, along with uh, the cloud-based primary to produce the ceiling grid. Um, and really, that's just sort of a visual representation. What's actually populated is only the cloud-based primary. Now, you can run into situations where you have the 250 um, in the cloud-based primary um, trying to average against, say, you know, a lower viz of like 3,000 or, or 300 or whatever. Um, so in that situation, the only real option I've had to try to mitigate that problem is to, to do a transformation. So I'm transforming the actual cloud-based primary grid using a log. Um, function and so that what that does is it it does weight the lower amounts a little stronger than what the higher amounts would be weighted um, but the idea that was there's a huge gap between 250 and say 3 and I didn't want that 250 to be weighted too strong so you know it's a sort of give and take situation um, if there are other people that have you know sub suggestions on another option there I'm, I'd love to hear it. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of those tough things. I mean, that, it, it's a good question, and the best answer I could come up with was taking that logarithmic function and then um, going back using the exponent afterwards. Um, it seems to work well. As soon as I implemented that, Consort started verifying um, much, much, much better. So, um, I don't know, Jeff, did you have any other, like, suggestions on ways that I might be able to handle that? Well, the only thing I was thinking with regards to the, I mean, are the ceiling grids being sent to NDFD? Because, you know, can we set that default value from a minus 30,000 to something positive so it'll interpolate that better? Um, well, yes, the ceiling grids are sent to the NDFD, but those grids really are never edited. Um, so. I guess maybe I'm not understanding your question exactly right. So basically, what it does, the way the code works, like aviation finalized, is what produces the ceiling. Is it looks at your sky cover, 
and wherever it sees um, clear skies, it's going to set it to, uh, to the negative 30,000. And then where it doesn't, it leaves the ceiling alone. Um, so actually it's broken or overcast is where the, the cutoff is. So um, it, it, it sh the, there shouldn't really be an interpolation issue with that because it's just it's just a sheer mask looking at your sky cover grid. Yeah, you're never going to touch your ceiling grid. You're only going to touch cloud-based primary, so there won't be any interpolation issues. And NDFD is programmed, it can only see negative 30,000. That's why it, it's programmed that way. Right. So when, when the NDFD sees the negative 30,000, um, it knows that that's clear skies. Okay, so we should or just no, be doing it. We should just be working off the cloud-based primary and then let Aviation Finalize generate the ceiling. Yep. That's correct. Gotcha. Thanks. Okay, Marsha, that's the only questions I had. Um, okay, great. Can, can, someone, can someone just uh, pipe in and say what office you are? I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, if you have any questions, go ahead and, and either type it in or raise your hand because if I unmute everybody, we get a lot of feedback. So yeah, sorry about that. That's all right. Um, Chris Keitro does have another question. Uh, Chris, do you have a microphone? Can you ask the question? Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, all right. I'm sorry, Marsha. I, I missed your change in slides before, so I didn't catch the visibility 12 panel. But uh, that being said, when, when we run, I think it's the aviation populate procedure, there's a button about deriving uh, visibility from fog. What's the common procedure for that? Should we be leaving that blank or uh, um, unselected and then just manually filling in the, the fog? I, I seem to remember something from the past where it was recommended that we didn't uh, touch that button. Can you um, give a little bit more information on that? Has that changed? Yeah, I can, I can elaborate on this. This hasn't changed at all, but it completely depends on what your situation is that exact day that you're forecasting. All right, so what, I'm, what I would use it for is I would say yes. I'd put that check mark to yes if I was going to be, um, and let me just, I'm trying to remember what it says exactly, but yes, fog from visibility, okay? Yes, that's mm -hmm. I would check that yes. If my con shorts or you know manual grids are giving like radiational fog overnight, okay. This is this is my lazy way of putting in fog into my weather grids that match my visibility. Because if I had that selected to no, then what would happen when I finalized if I didn't put any fog in my weather grids, right? And I had visibility below five miles or whatever in my visibility grid. Finalize would wipe that out. It would change it all to seven, and I would get no fog. There's, it, so that's just saying, okay, don't put fog into your weather grid. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. I'm just, I guess I'm still a little bit confused on, so that will put in like a BR for five miles, yeah. even if we don't have any visibility reductions in our weather grids? Is that, am I understanding that correctly? That's wrong. You've got to have the vis visibility reduction. You've got to have the visibility reduction. So yeah. will that like trump what you what you may or may not have in the weather grids then, I'm assuming? Yes. Okay, understood. All right, well, thank you, Marcia. Just add, Actually, like if you have pre-sip in your weather grids, it would just add the fog to that. It won't it won't overwrite what's on there. I believe it should just add. It won't overwrite pre-sip, but it will overwrite other fogs. Right, yeah. All right, so if I have, um, so if the con short's giving me like four miles in BR, but I have no reduction of visibility in my weather grids, if I select yes and I run the TAF formatter, it'll put the, the, redu the reduced visibilities in the final TAF product. Yes, and it will alter your weather grids to put patchy fog or area of fog okay. or however you define it in your GUI. Understood. All right, yep. thank you guys. Yeah. Okay, I uh, got a hand up from Aaron Dorn. Aaron, you're unmuted. You want to go ahead and ask a question or comment? Uh, we were just going to share. Can you guys hear us? Yeah, sound good. Yep, hear you. Okay. Uh, uh, 
uh, what our experience here at Aberdeen with so far testing out this uh, this functionality, it's working out pretty well for us. Um, we have some uh, additional tools that we can use, like Scavec, to you know do a quick glance through all the various different types of guidance uh, that's available to these visibility and cloud-based primary grids and so forth. So, um, it you know we're we're enjoying it here. That's great to hear, Aaron. Thank you very much for sharing. Yep. We have that Scavec tool here too, and we love it. Uh, do, you, do you guys want to, if for anybody else that's out there listening that doesn't know what SCAVEC is, is there a way you guys can uh, describe that in less than 30 seconds? <laughs> <laughs> it's a model blending tool. It basically, the, it's a big GUI that has pretty much any model you have in GFV that you can select a certain weight that you want to put into, um, into the grid that you're working with. Yeah, we've we've found that uh, tool to have quite a bit of utility here. As has our office. <laughs> it's a it's similar to the model blender tool, but I, our office took to scalar vector um, right away, and that's what our office has wanted to stick with. Yeah, yeah, it's like a visual it's like a visual version of model blender. That's correct. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Aaron. So, Aaron, um, are you guys are you guys in the experimental phase? Are you testing, just trying it still? I'm going to defer to our Sue here. I think he has a better way of saying yes or no to that than me. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Jerry and Marcia. This is Steve. Um, hey, Steve. Well, since you know, we kind of, or I was doing it, and and Carrie was doing it, and um, Marquette, we've, you know, there's. And then Aaron's doing kind of the editing now. So there's three of us that are kind of, you know, doing the, you know, the editing the grids and, and dumping out the tasks from that. The rest of the staff has been pretty good on, on taking up the, um, you know, kind of letting the con short load in, you know, kind of like we had set up with the, the last tech note and, and then just go ahead and, and grab the task, you know, run the formatter and then, you know, create the task from that that aspect. So I think overall they're pretty eager to kind of take that next step. Um, you know, it, you were starting to get more feedback or, or kind of questions on, on, on the editing aspect and, and going there because, you know, kind of like what you mentioned, it's, it's more of the, you know, you kind of, you know, go with the contour and then kind of see where you can kind of adjust or, or improve and, and you can, you can definitely tell the forecasters can, are starting to see you know, the areas, you know, like you mentioned with the diurnal queue or, you know, things like that where they can kind of go in and, and improve upon it where, you know, and if it's a larger system, I know we're kind of transitioning out of that now, but the spring, you know, they found a lot of utility with, you know, when we had the synoptic storms kind of moving through, they could really kind of just let it ride and, and go with what we were seeing. So um, that's kind of where we're at now. I think, you know, I hope here and then, you know, the next couple of months we'll start making, you know, more of a transition for um, for the rest of the staff. So, um, but yeah, they're definitely definitely finding a lot of utility with with it um, with it here. So, awesome, thank you. One thing I did want to comment on with the diurnal queue, I think you know I've done a lot of brainstorming and trying to figure out why con shorts does not behave very well with diurnal queue, and all I can come up with really is just that. It's, it, you know, the models that go into Contour, I mean, Contour's only going to be as good as what the models are. And when you start breaking down something like diurnal Q, it's going to be popping up lots of different ceilings across, or, you know, cloud-based primary um, grid points across the whole CWA or whatever you're looking at. So I, I just think it's because it's so broad in nature, Contour really struggles to come up with a good value for that kind of ceiling. So um, I, I don't really have a good solution for this at this point. I would greatly love it, um, you know, if there's some ambitious person out there that wants to start looking at, you know, possible ways of trying to utilize the models differently than how I'm using them um, to help out with the, 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 the diurnal issues, um, diurnal cue issues, I, you know, 
let me know, and I, I'm happy to work with people. Um, I know uh, Paul Wollen over at Pueblo, just with the OBS database, um, in, with one of these calls, pointed out that he, he didn't think it was covering their area very well with cloud-based primary, and he, he found a problem. And, you know, I fixed that problem, and I, I believe the OBS database is performing better because of it. So I'm always open to anybody, you know, to, to provide feedback and to help help improve the process. That's, that's the whole point of this. And, you know, once we get into the test bed phase, we're going to have open ears. We want to make sure that this is an evolving process that we can make um, better for the whole uh, region. Yeah, Jerry, one of the uh, one of the things we had tested in Marquette um, and played around with, we had, I think I modified one of the uh, tools, uh, one of the people from Eastern Region had with, you know, kind of using like the LCL or the, the CCL values and um, we found that useful for some of the diurnal Q situations, but I think what you guys have in there with adjusting the RH kind of does the same or a similar type process, but um, if you're interested in, in those tools, I can, I think I had them merged into one, I can send that to you. Yeah, that'd be great. And that, that, you know, that was, you know, one of the things I was trying to brainstorm is if there was a way for me to trigger a diurnal Q day to maybe have kind of short use an RH, you know, type tool instead. Um, I, I don't know how easily that would be. Uh, yeah, I'm sure with some work I could get it to go, but, you know, that's some, some thought process that I had had. So, yeah, please send that stuff on over, Steve. Okay, will do. Okay, I have another question here. Um, this is from Andy in Wichita. Um, this question is, how can we acquire the 12 panel ceiling and visibility D2D displays? That will be, um, it's actually a requirement in the tech note that was just released. Uh, what I found with all the beta sites, I have like seven beta sites to test this tech note, so it should be a pretty, I'm hoping it's a pretty solid tech note. Um, I found actually that this 12 panel is very useful in determining um, models that were missing at sites. Every, just about every one of the beta sites was missing a model for one of the elements. So if you're missing a model, your con short isn't going to behave quite as well either. So this is it's actually very beneficial for people to get that procedure and um, part of the techno actually has the offices open it up and look at it and then, you know, if they're missing a grid, it'll come up black. In that in that box, so that and then after that, it's contact me or the grid methodology team to try to diagnose why you're missing that exact model. Because we need to make sure all these models are being ingested correctly. And you know, throughout the AWIPS two build process, some models have become operational, some models have changed grid changed grid two table, and so there's been lots of little changes. And then you throw in the NWS and this can fix any for any number of reasons. Things can have, could have thrown your office out of whack, and maybe you just missed something. Um, so I, I think that you know, looking at it that way and being able to see all the grids that pretty much go into con short um, is a good way to find out if you're missing stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. So after this tech note is installed at your office, which is required um, by June 26th. June 24th, then everybody will have this 12 panel procedure. All right, another question from Dan Baumgard. Dan, you're unmuted. You want to go ahead and ask your question? Uh, hey, guys, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. All right, cool. Uh, hey, I asked you on that last call we had in January about that whole public fog issue uh, with having to include fog in the weather grid for visibilities above like one mile when it's not significant to the public just to get it into the TAFs. Is there, at that time, I think Brian had stated that there's something being that's being worked on. Is there any idea on answers or solutions forthcoming for that? Dan, um, the National Digital Aviation Services team has not brought that up again since. Um, so no, no work has been done on that. 
and um, I can I can bring it up again, and uh, I just don't know about how many issues it's causing. So I guess we're okay with just putting fog in there for five miles and less in the weather grid and yes. having it. That's the way it's been for now. I mean, this is something, it's a good thing to talk about, Dan. We do, I mean, it should get talked about. And it's, you know, I'll bring it up with the grid methodology team. Um, and we can also bring it up with uh, the national team again. Um, I think it's something that should be handled on the national level. Because obviously this is getting pushed. You know, it, it's the, the goal here is to push this whole DAD thing across the whole country. So that's why you know we here in Central Region are trying to sort of lead the way and trying to get our whole region on board with um, DAS. So I think it should come from a national perspective on how we handle this this particular situation. Yeah. So Dan, I will bring it up in the email list again. Yeah. I mean, from an impact standpoint, it's just we're going to have a lot of fog in our forecast. Yeah, and we're going to be over forecasting fog because yeah, climatologically. In the, yeah. Climatologically, it's just not, the, the public doesn't sense it that much and aren't impacted by it, those those high visibilities. I think what it'll come down to is what NDFD will read and, and put out to, uh, in, in the public weather grid. And that'll be an NDFD national level person in DC. Yeah, I mean, I could see something like once they get the Viz grid in there, um, doing a QC check against the Viz grid and only allow fog to be put in if the Viz uh, is a certain, um, you know, some nationally de designed height or I mean distance. Yeah. <laughs> so your results right. that you see from this conversation, Dan, might be a little, little delayed in getting implemented across the country, but I know that you're not the only person thinking this out there. So. Um, this will become a national issue. So I'll bring it up and we'll try to get the ball rolling on that one, okay? Yep. I guess I have one quick question too on the operational proving ground um, DAS work that they're going to do. Um, do you guys, are you familiar with what their goals are for that or how this will feed into this project? Yeah, um, there's going to be I think four weeks this summer, but the two, the first two weeks are in June. And what they're going to be testing is how, how to read in Aviation Weather Center experimental grids, how the central region people like us, everybody in central region does the digital aviation services, like pop populating with con short initially. And then they're going to test or, you know, have someone looking at how other parts of the country do the DOS grids, which I think they're kind of starting from scratch every time. Yeah, and you know, they're from, from my understanding, they're going to be basically standing up four models. One would be the Aviation Weather Center grids. Um, another would be kind of short. Another is a model that um, an improved ceiling and viz grids from G lamp, which involves the HER, they call it the G lamp meld. Um, and the, the other one is something that may not actually get in, but I know they're working hard to try to do it. It's a uh, point blend from GSD, and they're whole producing cloud-based primary um, visibility grids for that. So they want to sort of take a look at that process and, and how that impacts, you know, digital aviation services. Yeah, so they'll be evaluating different methodology of doing grids. Okay, and then maybe we'll feed in, we will, I guess, look at the best or the recommendations that they put out to possibly migrate towards the, a better practice. Is that it? Yes. Ideal, yep. Ideally? Okay. Yeah, hopefully we can all come up with some compromise or some way of going forward as a national level because OPG is national level. Right. Yeah, and, and right now here in Central Region, until we hear otherwise, you know, from the national perspective, 
um, you know, we're we're working toward we're looking at kind of short, and maybe even our our own test beds may find a different model that performs better, or they they want to use a different model. Um, but the idea is we want to start with a common starting point um, at least four times a day. So that's that's what we're pushing for. That's what the grid methodology team has in our proposal. Um, right now it's for kind of short since that seems to be um, verifying the most consistent of all the models. It may not always be the best, but it seems to be among the top three most of the time. Okay. Thank you guys and thank you for your work on this. Thank you. I know you're spending time on it. So thank you. Okay. I do have another question from Andy in Wichita and I'll go ahead and read it here. It says um Will the TAF formatter enter BR instead of FG in the TAF if GFE visibility is greater than one half mile? Andy, yeah, the answer is yes. That was a bug in the previous TAF formatter and it is fixed. Okay. He said thanks. Um, <laughs> At this time, I do not have any other questions or hands up, so. All right, so we have, we, we can stay on another five minutes or so, otherwise people can start dropping off, but if anyone else wants to pipe in and say how, how everything's going at their office, uh, now is a good time. Did any hands go up yet? <laughs> Well, Chris Guitro had his hand up, but he took it down. Uh, okay. Chris, go ahead, Chris. You're on. I'm muted. Hi, guys. Um, Marsha, I kind of developed like a four-step process to try to get the Pleasant Hill office geared towards uh, DAS for the start of fiscal year 17. We're currently in phase two right now where I've actually got my forecasters um, running the the aviation populate and finalize and just you know starting to get in there and start messing around with some of the grids and stuff like that at right at this stage right now I don't have them actually creating the grids from them and uh, from the the tasks from the grids unless they choose to and um, some some of my forecasters are actively doing it but um, our goal is by October 1st that we'll be doing everything right from the DAS grid so I guess we're, we're kind of halfway to that point so we're, we're slowly making some progress. That's great. Uh, Chris, which office are you at again? I'm at Pleasant Hill. Okay, great. Um, and so awesome. And so the next step you could do with your forecaster is, is just have them start with this formatter. Uh, the formatter that's being downloaded into this tech note right now, mm -hmm. that's, it's, it's a good formatter. It's pretty decent. Um, yeah, if, you, uh, if you don't like all the prob 30s, you can reprogram it, or you can do what our forecasters do and just delete the prob 30s in the line. Right, right. I'm going to go in there. My our ITO actually installed the update yesterday, so and I haven't been back to the office, so that's why I asked about the visibility fault panel. But uh, okay, um, we're going to go in, and um, my Sue doesn't want us to use uh, prob 30, so we're going to probably go ahead and just get rid of the prob 30 in the weather rules, and then. Uh, uh, start going from there. So, that do you think there's going to be a lot of modification necessary to the weather rules based on what the new formatter has to offer? No, I don't think so at all. Because what we gave you is a working version that works here. And okay, if you need help getting the Prob 30s out of it, just um, mm -hmm. contact contact Jerry, and we'll get you a script for that. If if you need help, because I I think you can figure it out. It's pretty easy okay. in the programming department. That sounds good. Well, I appreciate all your guys' help. I mean, this has been fantastic, uh, the information you guys have provided. So uh, good job to you guys. Thank you. And uh, also with the weather rule modific modifications, um, GSD, Sarah, Sarah from GSD made a nice document that tells all about it. So okay. everything's linked into, into the toolbox and uh, into the formatter, formatter install doc. Awesome. I think, I, print, I think you may have sent that to me a couple of weeks ago and I printed it out. So I don't have it in front of me, but I've, I've got it at the office. So. All right, great. Well, thanks a lot, Chris. Uh, thanks, guys. Yep, no problem. All right. Did any other hands go up? Otherwise, we'll end the call. Yeah, no, no other hands at this time. All right. Thanks, Jim, and thank you very much to all of the offices who could attend today. 
we'll have the same webinar again tomorrow and hopefully capture some of some other offices that weren't able to come today. All right. Thanks, Marcia. And again, we're recording this and we'll send this out at a later date uh, for others to see. Right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day.